again, everybody, and we're continuing on with sources of information that guide the assessment process. One of the most important sources of information would be those, that information that's, that indicates to us what we need to assess and what reveals to us what we need to ex, um, assess are the uh, basic research that identifies what are the components of speech and language or the speech and language system that you're planning to assess. What, what are the parts of those things? Because it's the parts of those things or these components that you're going to be evaluating to see if they are intact or not. At least the behavior they generate suggests, does the behavior suggest there's a problem or not? Well, you have to be aware of, think about, the what components make up that part of speech and language that you're planning to assess. So let's, um, what will reveal the, that to you are, are, if I can click this uh, head here somehow, are paradigms or theories. I know people often say, don't talk about theory talk about just what to do. But really, um, a theory that, that really theory reveals to us what actually exists in the world, strangely enough. And what exists in the domains of speech and language are of, of extreme interest uh, and um, utility in the assessment process. We're going to look at paradigms, which is a synonym, a synonymous term for the term theory. Paradigms that reveal what constitutes language? Now, I did in going uh, looking at the par going ahead and looking at several paradigms here. I want to remind you that this course on diagnostics is an interesting course, as I said during session one. I don't teach. I'm not here to teach new things about speech and language or about uh, speech and language disorders, because you've had specific courses in language acquisition in children, language disorders in children, language disorders in adults, etc., right? This course intends to help you create, construct a mental model uh, with which you can apply information you've received across different courses or experiences as a student or as a, as a professional so you can apply that information to, the, to a problem-solving process that we call diagnostics. So in reveal, reviewing these paradigms, I'm really bringing, uh, re, re, kind of directing your attention to information that I know you've received in other courses. But I'm asking you to, in a sense, take a step back and reflect upon this information and uh, put put it, get it ready, so to speak, or store it in a sense, or um, use it to create a headset which you'll use to apply to the problem-solving situation that assessment will be when a client appears with a problem who, who suspects there might be a problem, and it'll be your job to figure out what that problem might be. So these paradigms that reveal what constitutes speech and language, those paradigms will be very important guiding, will provide very important guiding information. And uh, the four paradigms we're going to be, we're going to be looking at four paradigms. Those are the Bloom and Leahy developmental paradigm, and I know 100% for sure you have background in that. We're going to look at the nativist Chomsky. Uh, Chomsky and paradigm. We're going to look at information processing and we'll look at the behavioral model of Skinner and Lovas. So let's begin and let's review what is language according to Bloom and Leahy. I hope you uh, already have the answer in mind. Remember the definition, language is a code whereby ideas about the world are represented by a conventional system of arbitrary symbols or signals for communication. 
Yes, you've heard that definition before. Well, that de definition comprises the components of language according to Bloom and Leahy. Uh, and I'll skip over the Chomsky little statement there and come back to that. Let's stick with just Bloom and Leahy right now. And this, this uh, chart or figure <coughs> really represents the components of the definition you just heard. Because you heard the idea that language is a code, a code, and that um, translates into a symbol system. It's a set of symbols, a code, that stands for what in that definition? Yes, ideas about the world. So ideas about the world um, represent one part of language that we say is which, what's that term, the term here that, that is associated with ideas? That's right, content, content. So language, one component of language is content. Those I, and content can be defined as, to begin with anyway, as ideas about the world, and also affect feeling state about the world, right? Content. What's the code? It's the form. It's phonology, morphology, syntax, story grammar, the symbol system that stands for the content, and that's separate, and all the subcomponents I just mentioned, phonology, morphology, syntax, they're separate. And um, Bloom and Leahy um, refer to that whole symbol system and its components as form. They refer to ideas about the world as content. And they also point to use, which relates to what? the reasons for talking, and the uh, skills that we have, the pragmatic skills to achieve our, the intent that we have when we speak. So Bloom and Leahy identify content, form, and use as the components of language. And you see that blue kind of oval in the middle, overlapping content, form, and use? That indicates that whenever, whenever you have uh, language, whenever you're, you're observing language, you're observing the intersect, intersect of content, form, and use. That is, any utterance that we recognize as language is an utterance that has in it content, that is ideation and affect, form, that is, it's made up of a symbol system. It's being represented through a symbol system. And use, it's being expressed for a reason with social skills attached for achieving that goal of communication. Following me on this? Those three things, content, form, and use, all together, overlapping and happening simultaneously, constitute language. Implication? we have to keep in mind that given any speech and language problem that we're asked to assess, we have the possibility that content, form, and or use are implicated. Now notice underneath those, uh, those little uh, bubbles, or those components of language, are three other um, forms, so to speak, or three other shapes, shapes, let's say that, I don't want to confuse you with the term form, language form, three other shapes, and one shape, they're kind of, what are they, um, like pyramids, not pyramids, what are they called, quadrilaterals or something, there's a name for those things, well, uh, whatever they are, uh, they contain three, uh, they re really contain the names of three additional behavioral systems that are not part of language, but that interact with language and influence language. They're not part of language. They're external to language. Unlike content, form, and use that are internal to language. And those three systems that are external to language but still can influence language and therefore still have to be assessed, are cognition, 
psychosocial, and sensory motor system. Cognition having to do with awareness and the use of awareness for problem solving, reasoning, uh, learning. Psychosocial um, system, which, uh, which uh, the psychosocial system, which are, um, comprises affect and our uh, social conditioning. And the sensory motor system, notice the two parts of the word sensory motor. Sensory, which receives um, information really from movement. Um, and uh, all the different senses that we, uh, we use uh, to um, receive information and the motor systems that we use to express information support those aspects of speech and language that are internal to the language system. All the systems internal to the language, to language, and the systems external to language all have to be taken into consideration given any speech and language problem. You're in a complex area in assessing speech and language. This is Bloom and Leahy's conceptualization of language. And by the way, uh, let's take another moment to think about what comprises those subsystems or com uh, components internal to language in the Bloom and Leahy model. Content we said first was ideation, ideas about the world, and affect, the feeling states associated with these with ideas. But if you're going according to the operating with reference to the Bloom and Leahy model, content is um, signifies and is supported by the following internal to language things. One is conceptual word knowledge, what words mean specifically, and categorical word knowledge. I always say that any word represents a category. So, it, with a couple of exceptions, like Ping Pong, my dog, who, who I don't have with me right now, but um, is typically harassing me. Ping Pong is Ping Pong. There's only one Ping Pong. But dog, now there's a word, and dog is a category, isn't it? There are all kinds of dogs out there, including Ping Pong, but also including Collies and German Shepherds, etc., so, uh, so dog is a category. It's it's in fact subordinate to the superordinate category animal, and superordinate to the subordinate categories of uh, collies and uh, pika palms, etc. If you're following me, these are aspects of content, and also relational knowledge, which is. Um, which is uh, picked up or identified in the Bloom and Leahy model as content categories, object, intra-event relations, and intra-event relations picked up in content categories, such as existence, action, locative action, causality, temporal, epistemic, content categories, if you remember back to that Bloom and Leahy model. And these are about relational knowledge. They are types of ideas about the world, and they are very important to um, creative, competent speech and language function, content. Now in the area of form, we have phonology, as I mentioned before, morphology, syntax, and discourse aspects of form, conversational structure, and narrative structure, or story grammar. All of these are components of form. Any of these can be in, um, influenced or be influencing a language problem. They're in fact intrinsic to language, these, these behavioral subcomponent systems. Then we have use to remind you that use signifies the reasons for talking, which we refer to as function. 
and the context sensitivity of language. Uh, language is sensitive to the linguistic context that we find ourselves in, and that means the speech that's being directed upon to us by others, whether the others are speaking, uh, are, are teachers or friends, um, and what the, uh, what the rules are of, uh, of uh, good communi acceptable communication. Do we establish eye contact? Do we reference uh, pronouns? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. What kinds of cohesive devices do we use to connect utterances? Are we staying on topic? How do we, you know, maintain topic, shift topic, given uh, the individual and the role they're playing? Uh, that, that, that we're speaking to. That is the linguistic context. The non-linguistic context also influences uh, speech and language, whether it's a classroom we're working in, whether it's a play setting or a family setting. Each shift in setting influences language, and our adjustments to these shifts, our, our ability to, uh, to speak in a way that's appropriate to the context and that's most adaptive to the context we find ourselves in, those are aspects of language use identified by Leahy and Bloom, and problems in these areas could influence, of course, could be problems that we need to identify in an assessment, because they certainly can be influenced, they are part of speech and language behavior, according to Bloom and Leahy. Um, another part of what I just said was contingency, how we make connections, connections between ongoing conversation Staying on topic, initiating and uh, shifting topic, and in narrative stories that we tell, how we keep things connected. These include the prag and then use again includes the pragmatic devices, the social devices we use, appropriate to the various contexts we, specific contexts we find ourselves in, that we're using to achieve success in our speech, in our communication. See, I'm, at, I'm using, hopefully, pragmatic devices appropriate to a teacher or instructor. And, well, we're not live face-to-face -face here, but if we were in a classroom, I'd be behaving one way, and you would be behaving as students in your student way, using pragmatic devices to uh, get a good grade, right? Uh -huh. uh, and what again, 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 don't forget, remember our last lecture, what was the or last session, what were the primary functions of language that we identified according to Bloom? Content, the expression of content of mind, both the cognitive or awareness part and the emotional part to express intentionality, what we're trying to do, right? What, what the individual is trying to do, and to address intersubjectivity. that need to socially ex get express content of mind to another, whether it's a um, significant other, a caretaker, a teacher, instructor, student, student to instructor, right? And uh, I guess our next, this next slide reviews intersubjectivity, the drive to be social, the drive to express intent of m intentions and content of mind, get it beyond one to one uh, one's own self. Beyond talking to yourself, you want to, um, we, we, we adults and children are, have a drive to express what's on our mind to others. And we need the listener to acknowledge our intent. Children need that. I need that. I need you to acknowledge my intent here to um, teach about Bloom and Leahy, right? And about the diagnostic process itself. And uh, whether it's child or adult, we're looking for the listener to acknowledge our intent always so that we have a sense of confidence. Let's pause here for a moment and then we'll come back and think of uh, shift
perspective slightly and take language from a slightly alternate point of view, the Chomskyan point of view.